I'm McNeil Haggerty. And I'm Soon Haggerty, and this is Cars of Culture with Jason Stein. McKeel, Soon, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Cars and Culture. McKeel, how are you? Oh, we're grateful to be here and uh, hope you're doing well in these interesting times. Indeed, Soon, thank you for being part of the program as well. It's our pleasure. It's gonna have, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have a lot of fun, and I know that you've both had a lot of fun recently. And I'll just go to the lead of the New York Times from December, because um, I'm guessing that uh, when, when one goes down a path, you, you never know that you're going to end up with an opening paragraph in the New York Times that says, for one Monday in early December, the New York Stock Exchange played the role of vintage car museum. One end of Broad Street outside the exchange sat a high-roofed and stately 1921 Duesenberg coupe, and at the other end, a fearsome 1966 Ford GT40 race car, and between them, encased in a glass vitrine, was in very cheery 1967 Porsche 911 S. Congratulations to the two of you. And McKeel, you were highlighted in that article. Tell me what it meant to be at the New York Stock Exchange, more importantly, driving around lower Manhattan, talking about all of this with the New York Times. Well, the, the whole experience of ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange and, and everything leading up to it has been kind of surreal because you, you set out a path like this with very clear intention. You don't just back into something like this. You go about it with months of work. Uh, it's, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it takes a lot of people. And then when the day finally comes and it was such a beautiful setting, which soon and the whole Moran team helped work together with the New York Stock Exchange, it just felt like not just a cool celebration for our career thus far, but really a celebration for the car world, which was a big reason that we went public to begin with. Uh, it's, there isn't a publicly traded company really that's in the automotive space and the lifestyle side of things. And uh, we're just really honored to be there and it's been crazy. Now, the second part of your question, which is doing an interview for the New York Times while driving this um, BMW 2002 through the streets of Manhattan, that was, <laughs> that was pressure packed because I was, it was not my car and I didn't know where <laughs> I was going and I wanted to sound uh, articulate. Well, you certainly did that. You came off in the interview well. And the setting, to your point, was just dynamic. And soon, I know you had a lot to do with that. The planning of it, the execution, the fact that cars were on display. I mean, it used to be you rang the bell at the exchange and you just kind of went home. What you did is you set up a car museum on the streets of lower Manhattan. Incredible soon. Well, I mean, we were super excited about it. When we first did the site check, we said, okay, you know, exactly what Mikhail said. There's not a lot of uh, companies on the uh, stock exchange that kind of have this celebration of the car world. And we said, what's the ultimate celebration? It's really about this idea that you're actually engaging with the car community. So we decided to put three cars outside and host our own cars and caffeine. So it was such a cool day and, and the weather was perfect, 60 degrees and just a ton of um, passion around what we're doing and this beautiful facade. And, you know, luckily it was Christmas week. And so we had this beautiful Christmas tree. So I think literally all the stars were aligned. It was just a perfect day. Certainly came off looking extremely good, but let's, let's go to the purpose of doing all of this. McKeel, you were quoted as saying in that article that the purpose of the company is to save driving and car culture. What did you mean by that? Well, thanks. It's, um, you know, it's really been a multi-year process to develop that purpose for our business. And in no small way, it's this combination of the fact that we're really passionate about driving and, and cars and, and, the, and the benefit that car culture in its most positive ways brings to the world. And um, yet there is this other narrative that's starting to happen in the media, and, and you know it very well, and your audience knows it very well, that Somehow cars aren't interesting anymore. They're going away. Younger people aren't, aren't, don't have the same level of passion the previous generations. And in fact, I have, I've had people just say, it's all going away. Forget about it. It's all gone. And in 2017, I actually had this CEO of a big automotive technology company tell me he was going to put me out of business because everything I thought I knew about the car world was going away. Sorry. He looked me in the eye and said, you'd find something else to do. And we, I was upset by it because I like to think that I'm pretty quick on my feet and I kind of have a pithy response for things, but I was just flat on my feet. I was dumbfounded. And we spent a lot of time thinking about it. And we said, 
we know something about the car world that these all these technologists and all these people predicting this doom of the automotive world uh, that they don't know. And this passion for cars has nothing to do with a passion for sitting in a four hour commute every day. Our love of driving is not about a long commute or traffic jams. This is about the pleasure of driving. It's about the, value, the other values that cars have, the, the signaling effect that they bring into our lives, the, the experiential aspects, whether you're into competition or just driving or showing or um, touring around and, and even the, the legacy aspects, which are in our mind, the most, most the, kind of the highest value that a car brings, which is up generations and down generations, this idea of passing on memory and skills and, and, and just great shared experiences. So I knew something that this guy didn't know and the car world doesn't talk about very much. And we made, decided to make our purpose that driving does need to be safe. Commuting, let's, let's let the technologists solve for commuting, but we wanna save driving and we wanna save car culture. And car culture is that piece of when we get together. And it's when we get together to enjoy looking at a few cool cars uh, in, at the New York Stock Exchange or whether it's reading a great uh, magazine, car magazine, or listening to a wonderful podcast or, or show like this, that's part of car, car culture. And we want to see it go on to the next generations. Soon it's part of your role within the company to ensure that the organization stays positioned correctly with its members and its partners. Did COVID and the return to the automobile make that easier for you because everybody fell in love with their car again to some extent? That's a really great question. Um, you know, when COVID hit, it really impacted our business in, in several ways and very much similar to many other businesses. The first thing you think about is your employees, then you think about your community, then you think about your industry. And what we found is, you know, we pivoted quickly for our employees working from home. So I think we handled that well. But then we, the next kind of thought is how do we ensure our members feel connected to the business? of Haggerty and also to the car world, right? And so we really came up with this idea and actually Jason, it's a, a, um, a foreshadowing of our new ads, which is like this idea of escape, right? So this is where, you know, you are stuck in your home for a certain amount of time. You can't engage with other, other people. And I think cars have always been the symbolism of escape and connection to yourself and to others. And so actually this is where we really double down on the idea of, great content from home, you know, building more of a community online. And then, so I just, it just emanated from there. So I think what COVID pushed us to do is to double down on this sense of community all around what we do. I'd build on it. it, it interesting during COVID, uh, the, especially the first, first parts where people were truly locked down. Um, and then really in the months following and even into this second year of the whole thing, uh, we saw commuting miles, of course, uh, dropped precipitously early on, and uh, that was a well-known fact. The roads were empty, and yet some of the first miles that anybody drove were in some sort of fun vehicle, whatever their in, in passion is, enthusiast vehicle. Of course, you also saw it with people riding their bikes or going camping or boating or fishing or anything like that that was outside, but driving for pleasure or taking a fun car out to, to go to the store and just maybe taking the long way there and the long way home became acceptable again. And I think it reminded people that there is more to these cool vehicles than, again, just that, that long commute. And I think we've all reassessed maybe the things that were important to us, reassessed what's valuable to us and the way we want to spend our time. So we actually saw pleasure miles go up while commuting miles drop precipitously. So I think what Soon's talking about taps right into that. Yeah, and you know, just to add one more last um, comment on that is we saw this connection with people actually having the time to work on their cars right, and celebrating those cars. And so it was really cool to hear stories from our members of spending time in the garage with their son or their daughter, time that they didn't have before and time to reconnect with their families. I mean, you saw this trend where people were having game night together again, right? The number one thing I heard from parents is I actually got to get to know my kids again. And a lot of it was done in the garage and these long drives. So it was, I actually think it was a really positive thing for the car world in many ways. McKeel, when you wielded that ceremonial gavel, you also said, this is only just the beginning. What did you mean by that? Well, part of it is a, a mindset that we have at Haggerty, which is to always be positive, always be forward looking, uh, not just from an automotive fun member engagement standpoint, but with our team members over 1,600 team members on, on Haggerty Worldwide. 
and growing pretty dramatically the next couple of years will show a lot of growth. And, and we take this growth mindset from beginning to end. We take it very seriously. And that is that we don't think uh, we as people are a finished product. We think there's more in front of us that we can learn and grow and, and do cool stuff together. And, and why not it be us? Uh, but from an automotive world, from a business standpoint, one of the biggest reasons we went public was not just to make Haggerty bigger doing what it's always done, but in fact, to uh, really start expanding our role in that automotive lifestyle realm. Yes, we started in the insurance world, but it's really been this evolution into more of an automotive brand, doing a lot more around events and media and experiences and those types of activities that we see further investment in. And it was when it was not in the article. And I said, we, part of the reason we went public was for the car world. We, went, we wanted to go create more value for it to keep serving that mission and purpose. And so it's only just the beginning. Yeah. You said maintain the unique character of those events that you said, the fun, the playfulness, the twinkle in the eye. And soon I, this is going to be part of, I mean, you can digitize tickets and concessions and make a better sponsor experience. But from a branding standpoint, you got to keep the twinkle in the eye, right? Yeah, I mean, for us, when we talk about this a lot, you know, um, the, what the industry is trying to focus on autonomous vehicles, that's getting from A to B. Like the cars that we focus on are all about fun and connection. So uh, when we think about our ads, when we think about our connection with our members, it's always this kind of, you know, this absolute wink this kind of fun we get, we kind of get why you bought these cars. We, we completely understand the story around it. So our view of this is, um, we also refer it to as these fun to drive cars. Everything in life I mean, is really about that connection. A lot of people talk to us about being an insurance company. And we said, nobody wants to talk about insurance, but everybody wants to talk about cars. So we have to ensure that we have that twinkle in the eye all of the, at all times. Another thing I guess I would say too, and, and it, it goes with, for anybody who's ever read our magazine or seen some of our editorial work or videos, um, we, we try to be a little humorous whenever we can at just poke fun at ourselves or poke fun at the fun aspects of the automotive world. But we try never to be cynical. Uh, this kind of twinkle of the eye in the eye is our um, kind of our mantra to ourselves. Does Is this something that kind of plays for a while or or, and we really try to never make fun at anyone's expense, even if maybe their car isn't your idea of a great car or, you know, something, some, you know, you get some pretty interesting kind of goofy people sometimes in the car world and we just celebrate them whenever we can. And um, so that's twinkle on the eyes, also a little bit of our internal code of how to, how to have fun and, and not be ever mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we have this thing that we say, all, all cars are beautiful. You never call a baby ugly. So we just kind of joke, <laughs> all cars are beautiful, right? Exactly right. What's beautiful is the fact that Haggerty is now roughly estimated at worth $5.3 billion. That's a uh, on the symbol HGTY. Um, you go back to 1984, McKeel, Frank and Louise Haggerty, Basement of Traverse City. It's a it's a well told story, but for those who don't know, it, a boutique insurer of wooden boats, and and then in the early '90s, the company began insuring collectible cars. Um, but we're a long way. Five point three billion dollars is a long way from the basement of Frank and Louise's house, your house, frankly. Yeah, I would. I you know my mother's still living, and and I so wish my dad uh, could be here to actually see this uh, because they really created this business together. It was their second time as, as business owners. They had a general insurance agency in Traverse City, kind of a local thing. And when they sold that, they decided they wanted to do something that was closer to their passion, which was either wooden boats or cars. But cars was already a kind of a well-filled space. And so they went where where there was plenty of running room, which was the vintage boat world and, and got pretty good at it and involved I and my sisters in the business. And when we you know, started up in the car world, we, we actually, there was a period of time in the 90s where we considered shutting it down. It wasn't doing very well. It wasn't making any money. It's hard to do. Insurance is regulated and complicated and a bunch of things. And, but as a family, we got together around the dinner table and said, let's just stick it out a little bit longer and see if we could change the tune. And the tune change was, could we start becoming more like a membership organization? Could we start having a little bit more fun and less talk about, no one wants to talk about insurance. Let's just make it about cars and, and brand and all of that fun stuff. And, you know, it just was like a rocket ship that we, we keep 
we keep going and going and and you're right mom and dad couldn't believe it my mom still can't believe it uh but we're you know we just keep reinventing ourselves i want to get into a little bit of your respective histories here and uh, mckeel just to stay with you for a moment something was just mentioned recently about COVID spending time with family and and that was in the garage. And that's exactly where you connected with your dad and working in the garage. Your, your, your dad was always in there doing that. And he, and he had this practice where the kids would pick a car and he would work with you to restore it over a couple of years. And the idea would be that it would be ready for you by the time you were old enough to drive. Yours was a 1967 Porsche 911 S. 500 bucks with lawn mowing money. You were 13. You still own it. I do. Um, and I'm so glad my sister was there and took pictures of the day that we dug it out of the snowbank in the middle of January when, when I was 13. And I was just following in the tradition that my oldest sister had a Corvair Lakewood station wagon. Tammy, my middle sister, had a, a 356B Roadster, Roadster Porsche that she still has. And uh, I was just following in the family tradition. And I had my 500 bucks ready from lawn mowing and bought the car and spent a couple of years restoring it. I was trying to explain to my, our, our nine-year-old daughter, Ava, when I did a show and tell with that car last year at her school that I paid $500 for the car, but the left rear taillight cost me $800 to replace. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had to mow a lot more lawns before I got the car back on the road. But what's, what's amazing about it for any of your listeners that know anything about cars is imagine that I didn't just pick up some random 911. I picked up a 67 S one of the yeah. Holy grail cars. And it happened to be about a mile from where we live right now. I, I, I ride my bike by this house where it was in the snowbank all the time. And, and just, I'm blown away that it was sitting right there. And thank goodness I kept it because it's become such a great part of my story and the business story. And, and what's cool about it is so many of your listeners, so many of our members have some, you know, maybe not that identical story, but some sort of fun story, a connection with a car, an inexpensive car they bought one day, you know, some trophy that they bought for themselves. It's just an awesome part of the, of the car world, these stories. You were an entrepreneur from a young age and started working at an apple orchard with 600 trees and discovered that you could actually make money selling apples. They usually sell out by 9 a.m. most days. But you went to be an English, uh, or, or you, you uh, continued on with your studies as an English and philosophy major, and then theology, St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in New York, like you studied the classics in philosophy, and you were going to do what exactly with that? Well, I fell in love, I, I can't say I fell in love with school uh, in high school. I, I think I liked sports and playing guitar and all the rest of the stuff that was fun. And when I got to college studying English philosophy, I, I, I fell in love with ideas and the, and the life of mind. And then I went to grad school, studied theology at the seminary. And then I went to do my doctoral work, which I, I did not finish in philosophy. And I just, I thought I would be a professor. I really liked the idea of teaching this idea of learning myself was so powerful. I wanted to share it with other people. And I had this real aha moment though, one day uh, sitting in a Plato class um, in, in Boston College on Plato's Republic. And that is on the left side of my notebook, I wrote out this idea if, that if the family business could just become more like a car club instead of like selling insurance, it mm. would really transform us. And I literally got up from my desk and I walked out of class and I never went to another class again. <laughs> moved, moved back to Michigan and it's, really been that trajectory that's transformed the business. It took me a couple of years to convince anybody that it was a good idea, but I, I remember writing it down in the notebook. I, I wish I'd saved it. And likely you were one of the only uh, philosophy students who went on to <laughs> look at Plato and go into business after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a little bigger audience now. And uh, I like yeah. that. Rather than writing books that four people will buy and never read. Soon your story is equally as fascinating, albeit on the other end of the world. Born in Saigon in 1975, your father fought for the South Vietnamese on the American side during the Vietnam War. And after the war ended, uh, Vietnamese citizens who'd fought for the South were requested to enter re-education camps. And 1979, four years later, the family fled to pursue a better life. You were almost five. Your dad had $300 in his pocket when he, you and the family and he landed in the United States and uh, your mother left 11 siblings behind. Your dad left 14. Tell me about what you remember about coming to America. 
Well, it's funny because, you know, I, I was just turning five. So I think when you're five, you have visuals, right? And, and whether you, you, it's visuals built from people recounting memories or you are, you know, really imagining those things. And I have visuals of just the actual boat journey. You know, it's like when you talk about, when I talk about kind of my immigration here, I, I absolutely tell people I'm one of the boat people. And it's either you remember that distinctly and you, and you have those visuals in your mind or you're fascinated about the story. I mean, what I remember is essentially this, this, you know, perfect example of the American dream, right? Which is if you, if you believe in something and you work hard and you really build a mindset, you can really build anything you want in the U.S. And I think we're the perfect example of that. So my memories when I was young is just work ethic, focus, um, you know, always moving forward. You know, people ask me a lot about my childhood and it's, it's tough. And, and Mikhail kind of laughs because he has to remind me of some of it because it's almost this kind of view that I never think about the past. I'm always thinking about, you know, how, uh, how to build forward from here. So I think if anything, my child childhood is thinking about, you know, work with what you have and how you build something greater for your family and, you know, your life. So it's, it's one of the best gifts I've ever received, actually. And your parents. One of, my, one of my favorite stories was when you first landed in the U.S. And I think you were staying in a really inexpensive hotel and all <laughs> nine of you in one room. And when uh, your dad showed up with a tray of cup of noodles and what a lot of people would think was, the, you know, oh, this is terrible. You're all like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was great. 40 days on a boat before landing in the Philippines where you stayed for six months at a refugee camp. Incredible story. And you get to America and your parents' entrepreneurial spirit really kicked in for you. And by the time you were 30, you launched your own PR agency, Lux Communications. And one of your mentors and a client of your previous agency was this guy named McKeel Haggerty from Traverse City, Michigan. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. What, so you, the entrepreneur meets an entrepreneur. I mean, that's in and of itself its own great success story. Tell me what you remember about McKeel soon. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting now just looking back and we have actually a very similar story, right? It's, it's really about two um, families building their um, businesses, one, you know, in the basement of a garage and one in the backyard of their house. You know, my parents built their entire business really around agriculture and they, they realized that um, where we lived in Fresno was the same climate as Vietnam, right? Hot you know, 100 degrees or so. And so we really connected on that entrepreneur spirit. We connected on starting from nothing and, and having this vision of what can we do for our communities in very different ways. Um, what I appreciated with Mikhail is that, you know, he was also very forward looking. And as you even heard today, you know, people think the culmination of, of Haggerty's path that was ringing the New York Stock Exchange for us is just the beginning. So it's writing the next chapter. So I think, I think um, the commonalities of our families and our business and our stories, what brought us, you know, really aligned. Um, and a lot of people do ask, well, how does it feel working together? How does it feel, you know, husband and wife working at the same company? And I said, I think that the magic is that we had that respect of a working relationship prior to um, me coming to Haggerty and, and, and getting married. So I think he's had quite a huge influence on, on me and our story. And you have uh, various tentacles to your story as well. But the one that I really appreciate the most is the Good Bowl. And the Good Bowl is your way of thanking the United States, as you have said, for taking your family in and giving your family the opportunity to achieve the American dream. Tell me about the Good Bowl. Well, um, you know, uh, I was born in Saigon and, uh, and I love Vietnamese food. And when I got married, um, I moved to this town, Traverse City, Michigan, where <laughs> there wasn't a lot of ethnic food. And so I would start recreating these meals at home and friends would come over and say, oh my gosh, I, I, I love Vietnamese food. You know, where can I find it? And so I kind of started having this concept in the back of my mind. What if I ever did a restaurant? And and people would absolutely tell me I'm insane and crazy. And it's kind of this, this kind of joke of, you know, if you want a lot, if you have a lot of money, you want to make a little money, you start a restaurant. And it's kind <laughs> of, so uh, I really love that, that saying, but really it's um, also my passion for impact and philanthropy. And so a good friend of mine said, why don't you take that, um, that idea you have of opening a restaurant and donate some of the proceeds to charity? 
And so for me, the natural inclination is just thanking the U.S. for taking us in. I rarely use the term give back because I don't feel like we took anything. I think people use that term a lot. My view is I think everybody can always contribute. Whether you take something or not, we all have a responsibility to support each other and make an impact. So that's where we came up with the model of a dollar per bowl goes to charity. And I was very specific that it's local, national, and global. I think you don't, even though it's important to think locally, I think we have to be um, thoughtful of the world around us. And so I think that's why that model was really built. It's just to have more attention to local, national, and global charities. So what's it like being in the culinary world? <laughs> I don't recommend it on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of what we've accomplished. We'll probably hit 100 grand in giving in, in about four years. And so I'm um, super proud of that. Um, I'm going to guess it's in the next month or so. So let's talk a little bit about some of the efforts that you've both been involved in related to automotive again. And I think you're both so integrated in the collector car hobby, not only with the insurance business, but everything else that we've talked about. I'm wondering if you can both share a little bit about how you found automobiles to be front and center of your passion. And Mikhail, maybe it does go back to that garage and the 911, but maybe what, where did it originate and, where, and how is it cultivated for you as a passion for car culture? I think it's really been organic. It, I, you know, we did not grow up in Northern Michigan, even though there were a few cool cars in our garage and we were working on them with our dad. We didn't grow up going to Pebble Beach or going to uh, the big car races or anything like this. Our, our only insight into the outside car world was was road and track coming to the house or Porsche Panorama. You know, so we we literally did two car magazines who so would come uh, you know, every month. And that was kind of our minor insight into the world. Now and then we might go to a regional car show or I remember making our way down to the Meadowbrook Concour, which is now Concour of America, which we now own. But you own, yeah. Uh, that we own. Um, and, and that was the first time I'd ever seen a Duesenberg or first time I'd ever seen something that was really exotic. And so our view of the car world was from the lens of, of primarily Fords. <laughs> our, our family were real big Ford families, even though I've described two Porsches already. Those were kind of later in my dad's uh, interest. And so I think this idea of just realizing that there's this larger world with, with media, with events, with experiences, and just organically getting to know it and then going outside of the US, going around the world has been absolutely fascinating. And I think maybe it's a little bit of my academic background, but I just, I've always wanted to understand how big this car world was. And no one could ever give me a good number. There, were, there was no good answer. I knew there were some car clubs that had, 10, 15, one claimed 60,000 members. And I discovered that they were actually counting husband and wife as two <laughs> than one household. Uh, and so there just, there weren't any good numbers. And I, I became fascinated with this idea that I think it's a lot bigger than people think. I think there's a much, much more of an ambient ethos out there of people liking cars. I think it's not, you don't have to be crazy about cars. You don't have to work on them, but it's just a, it's a symbol of success or a symbol of something special in your life. And we just discovered it was bigger and bigger. And that's where we just kind of, we grew and grew and grew with it uh, along the way as our insights deepened along the way. Soon, same question for you. Automobiles front and center in your world. Yeah, I actually kind of fell into it as well in a, in a very different path. So I finished school and I wanted to, um, to move from Fresno to LA to work for the Lakers. I had this passion for uh, sports and soon uh, came to find out that um, the head of PR there, there's no way I was going to replace him. And they said either he would um, retire or die on the job. That's, that's how passionate he was. So I said, okay, so let me figure out what other industry that I might be um, you know, passionate about. And I got my first job at a PR agency that specialized in automotive and luxury products. And one of my first clients was actually Mr. Bob Peterson and he mm -hmm. created Motor Train and Hot Rod. And just getting to know him and his story and his passion just hooked me. I mean, I, to me, I'm not a car guy or car girl in the way that I, nuts and bolts, but what I love about the car industry is actually the people. And I handled PR for Carol Shelby and what, you know, what a personality. Iconic. Yeah. And I, I handled his PR for five, six years, Mr. Peterson's for 10, Peterson Museum, Motor Trend. And so just. And by the way, Carol liked soon way more than he liked me. <laughs> are you, are you surprised? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know, to me, the, the car world is really about the people. 
So, uh, you know, and telling the story of Mr. Peterson and, and Mr. Shelby was what made me happy and thrive. And I think telling the story of Haggerty is what really keeps me focused on this industry. Mikhail, you mentioned Pebble Beach a moment ago. Most might not know about Dawn Patrol. So inform our listeners, if you will. I know what it is. But talk about the Concord Dawn Patrol and how many hats and donuts do you go through <laughs> on a regular basis? Well, uh, Pebble Beach is the Super Bowl of the high-end car world. Most people have heard about it. And what if, for anybody who has maybe not been there, it, it's a there, there are multiple events that happen all week in, out in Monterey, but the Pebble Beach stuff happens at the Pebble Beach Resort. And the Concord itself is on Sunday morning. And it starts very, very early. The cars are rolling out in the morning early. I've always been a morning person. One year early on, I remember I might have been up a little late last night. I was trying to find some coffee. And I looked out and in the mist on the, by the 18th green on the 18th fairway at Pebble Beach, I could see these cars just kind of rolling out slowly. And I walked down there and there were like five people watching and they were legends in the car world I later on discovered. And they were getting the first view of the cars rolling out onto the lawn uh, before they'd have their day of judging and all the awards. And I just thought it was so fascinating. So I showed up the next year and I think it was the third year I said, you know, this is a really special little thing. What if I just brought an air pot of coffee down? I knew these, some of these people now, there's five or six, 10 people and, and a box of donuts and just shared them with them. And we just watched the cars because by the way, these guys were so knowledgeable. Every car that would run, oh, that's an Espana Suiza, blah, blah, blah. That's a Bugatti type 35. Oh, that's that Packard I used to own. You know, there were just like one amazing car after another. And I was so blown away by their knowledge. And, and then that following year, we decided to memorialize it by producing a very small number of hats that we called the Pebble Beach Dawn Patrol. And I had to get permission to hand them out and be there and all this sort of, of thing. But it's, it's become quite a tradition. And now people show up at five in the morning uh, for hundreds and hundreds of coffee, uh, coffees and donuts given away for everybody to get a first look. And then we unveil the hat each year. And by the way, the hat has a unique color each year. Um, so we have, we, we have some members with all, how many was it this year, 13 or 14, I think. Um, yeah, that's right. and it, it's, it's so incredible to see that the passion around it. And in fact, I, I don't know whether I'm proud about it or not. Well, two, two good stories about the Dawn Patrol hats in particular. Usually some of them are for sale on eBay within hours for three to $500. Of course. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, of course, and, um, we, we were recognized by town and country magazine of all places as that the ultimate symbol of being a car person was to have Dawn Patrol hat. And it's a must be present to win. I don't care what kind of captain of industry you are. I don't care who you are. You are not getting one unless you get out of bed and come see us at Dawn Patrol. Mikhail, I feel like that story made those hats go on eBay, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're probably right. I don't know if they sell. I don't know if they sell. We just know they're for sale. Uh, but. It's fun yeah, to you see know, it is it is really cool uh, the Dawn Patrol hats and I've heard stories where people are walking in the streets of Europe and wearing one of the hats and somebody walks up to them and says you're a car guy or you're a car girl. It's that's one that's one of the coolest stories I've heard about that this recognition that you know um, this I'm so passionate about it I'm willing to wake up at 5 a.m. to get one of those darn hats. So they're limited, so six to eight hundred I think a year. Yeah, or something yeah. Like that. that's right. It's funny, we talked to Bruce Meyer on the show, speaking of the Peterson Museum, and he talked about getting the red hat at Bonneville. So <laughs> perhaps there's a hats and culture show in our future. Let me ask about events, um, because you just mentioned Pebble Beach, and uh, in the past year or so, uh, Haggerty has acquired three major Concours d'Elegance events, uh, Amelia Island, Concours in Florida, Greenwich Concours in Greenwich in Connecticut, and the Concours of America, which you mentioned uh, earlier in the Detroit area. Why the move into running events soon? Well, I mean, some of it was opportunistic in terms of some of the owners saying, you know, I've taken this event as far as I can go, 30 plus years. We need the next generation to really modernize it. And some of it is our, our larger intentional strategy is to figure out how will we 
continue the tradition of concourse, which are examples of some of the best cars in the world, but how do we modernize it to um, be family friendly? How do we get people in the 40s to bring their, their kids, their wives, their friends, their family? And so we want to make sure that concourse stay great, which is the finest examples on that Sunday, but could we bring a community sense to it? So what we've done in each of these examples is that we've kept the concourse uh, as elegant as possible in terms of the example but we've brought some fun on that Saturday. So in terms of this year at Greenwich, we brought Radwood, Concours de Lemons on Saturday, and then Sunday was the traditional Concours. So how do we keep the great things, but how do we make these Concours even better and more modern for the next generation of car people? Let's talk about that next generation, Mikhail. I know that is it is so important to you, and you mentioned it earlier, to, to do things like remove the velvet ropes from around cars at Concours and let young children get in and honk the horn, uh, it, just making it a much more friendly, friendlier attitude um, towards towards these events. And if you go down to Exotics on Broadway, which is, of course, the day before the Concours d'Elegance at Pebble Beach, you see a lot of young people. There are many folks under age 25 looking at the Paganis or looking at the Koenigseggs. So perhaps all is not lost when it when we come when it you know the subject comes to attracting a younger audience they're out there aren't they Mikhail? they sure are and we just we have to create entryways we have to create as many entryways as you possibly can and entry points entryways where younger people can can see great cars they're not hidden away in garages they're out being driven uh with people the owners don't need to be afraid to drive them i mean that that was the culture for a long time but even at pebble beach a couple of decades ago, there were cars dropped off on the trailers right up next to the lawn at Pebble Beach. That was the most those cars were ever driven until they created the tour and kind of forced the owners to go at least 60 miles with the car. So cars need to be driven. They need to be seen on the roads. Uh, obviously, when it comes to modern supercars, setting aside maybe a Pagani or a Koenigsegg, like you mentioned, but you think of a Lamborghini, you think of a Ferrari, you think of the great Porsches, they're making them in radically greater numbers than they ever were before. I mean, I, I never grew up seeing a Lamborghini ever. And now you, they're pretty frequent if you, if you go to one, a major city someplace and that's exciting. So we need to, we need to get those things out. And those are, the, those, are those entry points and, and maybe a, a, a you know, really brightly colored Lamborghini or something like that is not the ultimate in collector car, but if that's what gets somebody in, I'm great by that. And, and then if they suddenly realize like, well, I like Lamborghinis. What's this Miura thing? You know, could I ever have a Miura? And then, you know, and then it, or a Countach or something. And it goes on uh, from there. And so it's, it's all, everybody's always not just one thing. They, be, they become something else in the car world. And that's why it was really important for us to do these things. You know, we've been doing youth judging programs at our events uh, for years. We, we run about uh, between 75 and hundred of them. COVID was a little strange. Uh, we have a, another program we call a Haggerty Driving Experience, where we teach young people to drive manual transmissions, uh, which is maybe one blocker that we all can join together and help young people um, uh, learn to drive these things. I can tell you if the worst thing that happens is we have to replace a clutch now and then, which seldom happens, even with the, we have a fleet of cars that we train young people to drive in. Um, we, we just have to do it all and we have to put our money where our mouth is and invite them in, because if we don't, it's going to feel too exclusive or too expensive or was not for me or I wasn't treated well when I did show up. And uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to make it a, a great place to be because it's a, the car world's a great one. And, and why not do it? And soon, I'm guessing your messaging that will come forward will also emphasize the demographic uh, that you'd like to preserve or cultivate going forward. Yeah, and I, and I think um, for us, uh, you know, we built the Haggerty Drivers Foundation, and that's really about how we keep driving alive. And a lot of those elements of the Drivers Foundation and, and some of our messaging, our ads, it's always depicting this holistic view of the car world, right? It's no longer just an ad of one singular person working in their garage. It's mom, dad, families. And so I think this is that connective tissue um, that we really believe in. And and we don't have to create this story. I mean, this existed in Nikhil's family. I mean, when they're 13 years old, they got to pick the car to restore with their dad. I mean, how cool is that? So for us, this is all very natural in our DNA. And we have to keep that next generation and that next story alive. And you know what? Kids are fun. When you take them there, I mean, it's, it's, if you have kids and you see their eyes light up, 
you know, that brings joy to you. So it's like, you know, that old saying, you, you see the joy of life through other kids' eyes. And I think that's what, that's what we need to do for the car world. Well, that Chevy video that is going around right now all over the place of the, you know, the, the, the daughter restoring the car uh, for her father because of the memory of, of the mother who had clearly passed away. And it, it's really a it's kind of a wrenching video, actually. Yeah, very, yeah. yeah uh, maybe a touch long uh, too, but that is the story, and it's universal. And that's what Chevrolet gets. That's what the best car companies get. And that's what we're going to keep amplifying around the world, but up and down generations. It's not just younger right. generations too, um, but we're you know the the baby boomer generation who is I was firmly in control of the collector car world, while they're they're now starting to get from a population standpoint, crowded out by Gen Xers and millennials and so forth, um, they're going to be around a long time and still driving and collecting cars. So we're, we're here for everybody. Recently, Haggerty released its annual bull market list. These are the cool classic cars poised to rise in value in 2022. Let me go through a few of them. 1965 to 1970 Cadillac DeVille, a 1969 to 74 Ferrari 246 Dino, uh, let's go down to the 79 to 85 Mazda RX-7, the 85 to 95 Suzuki Samurai, which, um, uh, you know, a high school mate of mine probably would have never imagined that his Samurai would make that list one day. But how about the 08 to 12 Tesla Roadster Sport? What do the cars on the list say about the changing demographics in the hobby and in the country? McKeel, are tastes changing? Well, they evolve every generation, every few years, you start seeing changes. And, and this list is actually derived from our data group. So we have an automotive intelligence unit that studies the car market, um, millions of transactions and data points across auctions and private treaty sales, as well as we see a lot coming in and out of our world from an insurance standpoint. So this list was constructed using data and then, and then we created pretty pictures of, of the cars. Some people were joking to me, like, where did you actually find a pretty picture of a Suzuki Samurai? But uh, there are some well-preserved examples out there, ha ha, and some <laughs> real fans because they're kind of quirky little things and they're really loved. Um, a couple of things to point out on the list, uh, that, and there were more, you know, we could have a list of 30, but you, you can only, you gotta have, you gotta be limited and, and force the force the point here is, you know, a couple, couple things to point out. Obviously the, there's a Land Rover Defender on here, and you have the Suzuki Samurai, both little SUVs, little four-wheel drives. This has been one of the overarching themes and trends of the last few years is that the next generation of, of collectors, the people both really born post-1965, they're interested in, in vintage off-road. I don't, I don't want to call them SUVs, but so you think Jeeps, you think Land Rovers, you think... Um, Obviously, Broncos are hot, hotter than hot, right? Um, uh, International Scout, that kind of thing. So I think that's where you get those two, the Land Rover and the Suzuki Samurai. To see the Tesla Roadster is super cool. Uh, I probably, since going public and both the PR run up to it and, and since then, it's probably about the third question that everyone asks me, which is, what do you think about EVs and how, where will EVs play in this world? And my, my, uh, my answer, depending on how long I have, is, well, the automotive world has used electric drives for a long time, all the way back to the very beginning. But most people don't know what a Baker electric is. So you come forward and you realize these early Teslas, especially with the runaway success of the Tesla brand and the innovation of Elon Musk is the early Tesla roadsters are already well collected uh, and already have, a, have earned their place in the, in the collecting um, pantheon, I guess, if you will. And when you think of going forward, we're not threatened by electric vehicles. We're not. I, I think they're going to take their part. Everybody tells us they're coming. So let's embrace the good ones. Um, and I, I think in general, you're going to see sporty and high performance versions of them be the ones that are most collected. And so how cool is it that the Tesla is actually being quoted for insurance and, you know, driven as a collectible and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's fun to see how this list gets constructed every year because we don't, it's not, we don't make it up. It just, comes out of what people are interested in. And so kind of fascinating. You, know, you mentioned that Cadillac at the beginning, I think just great, affordable, huge American convertible. Um, lots of fun, not a lot of money, parts readily available, easy to make run. Um, it's awesome. Everybody needs a car to go out to ice cream in. That's one of my theories. <laughs> With a twinkle in your eye. With a twinkle in my eye, yes. One of the final things here, what do you both have in your collection soon? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, we have several cars in our collection. I have a 1962 uh, Speedster, a Porsche Speedster convertible. Wonderful. Um, and I think Nikhil has a matching Porsche you can talk about as well. Yeah, soon's, uh, soon's the reverse. We got a Speedster yeah. and a Roadster at the same time. So 57 Speedster and a 62 Roadster. We're both, we like Porsches. I'm still in a 67. Um, but I would say this is that, you know, whenever somebody asks me what my favorite car is, I kind of say, you know, my story is maybe a little unique and that that first most favored, you know, car is always going to be my 67. And so my next most favorite is the next one. And um, this of year, course. my my big uh, was something I, I wanted for a long time. And I jump all over the place. I'll go newer, I'll go older. And I went really old uh, this last year. And I had long wanted a, a pre-war Bentley. And I found an unrestored 1928 four and a half liter Bentley, uh, which is a gurney nutting body, original Wayman cloth body. And it is just so cool and absolutely the hardest thing I've ever driven in my life. <laughs> when when soon's been with me in it, I, I like have to like center myself, take a few deep breaths, get it running. And then if I can make a couple of clean shifts, it's a really good day. <laughs> I love it. One final thing. Do you find yourself, both of you, watching the stock market every day? <laughs> Tell Soon? the truth, Mikhail. Tell the truth. It's hard. It's difficult not <laughs> to. Uh, it's difficult not to. I can imagine. Um, and yet, I'm. I think after a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm getting used to just not staring at it because it's. I'm not. We're not doing anything to change it. It's yeah. all these other forces at play. I think what we've been excited about is, is since the original listing day and watch this really nice interest in, in what we're doing from a stock standpoint is hopefully that's a little bet on the future of the car world. And that's how I view it is, is if people are betting on us, they, they believe in our story. They believe that there's a future in the automobile out there and not just for the purposes of, of commuting or autonomous vehicles. And uh, so it's been awfully pleasing to see it happen, but I need to step away from it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> because it, it can drive you crazy. Yes. You know what? And it, it, it honestly, I, I'm pretty disciplined about it. By the end of the day, I, you know, I take a peek, and I really believe in this idea that what Mikhail said. There's not, there's nothing you can do on a day-to-day -day basis to change it. But I think it's that long-term vision, which we've always said in the beginning. Um, it is super fun to think about it, but you know, the day after the bell ringing, you're not a different person, right? And and you have a lot you need to accomplish. So. You know, you would think that we would say we don't check it and, and just to say that we don't, but the reality is you kind of forget about it. You know, the very next day you say, okay, here's my long-term vision. I now I really got to get it together, right? <laughs> so you're more focused on getting it together and then looking at that app. Well, here's what you're both doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You are saving driving and you are saving car culture. And I thank you so much, both of you, for being on the show. Thank you so much. It's great to spend time with you. Thank pleasure you. To, pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for uh, helping tell the story. Best of luck in the future. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.